All right, um, it's seven o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do it like I usually do it, <laughs> where I try, I try to ease into this. <laughs> I, I try to control myself, you know, before too long. But welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we are continuing our deep dive study into the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Uh, we're pretty deep into it at this point. And we, we've, been, we've been through a lot together. And today, tonight, this evening, we are discussing the vision, the vision that a bodhisattva has before they enter and abide at, here at the fourth bodhisattva level, the arkishmati, the radiant intellect, radiant mind. So it's, it's a beautiful idea of a level. Last week it was level three, this prabhakari, which means refulgent or luminous. And that was sort of, we are to understand sort of like the, you know, uh, the aura almost of the Bodhisattva at that point as being sort of luminous. And this, we, we get to this new level, this Arkish, Archishmati, which means radiant mind. Um, interestingly, actually, in the standard English translation that we're reading, this stage is just called radiant. They leave out the mind part. I, I'm not quite sure why they do that. It's a pretty well established. These 10 stages, by the way, you know, they're pretty well established in that sense. And the, the, the lore around these stages is well established. And the names of them are clearly well established. But in this one, they don't call it Arkish Mati, the, the radiant mind. They just call it Arkish, or at least the, the, in Chinese, it's just one single Chinese character for the radiance. Maybe that's because this is Bodhisattva Akshaya Mati, who maybe i don't i don't exactly know but i just want you to know that that's sort of the general idea of this evening is we're entering this fourth stage of the bodhisattva we've been reading for the last few nights uh, last few sundays we've been reading about these visions that the bodhisattva will have before they abide or come to each of these levels if you're, of course, interested in these levels, then I would refer you to the beginning of the sutra and the beginning of this uh, series, because this sutra and this series has been about the 10 paramitas, the, the 10 uh, perfections. I'm not a big fan of that translation of paramita, the 10 practices, the 10... Uh, excellences, the 10 paramitas of the Bodhisattva. Um, and for weeks, I had a list of all 10 up here, beginning with giving, going all the way to knowledge. And so the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva who makes this initial determination for not just enlightenment, but Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, this bodhisattva that makes this initial determination for enlightenment, the Buddha tells us, works on and cultivates these qualities, giving, moral discipline, patience, vigor, right? Uh, meditation, wisdom. And in the cultivation of those 10 paramitas, there are these 10 stages of development that a bodhisattva will come to. And this sutra at the point that we're in now has been telling us about these various visions that the bodhisattva will have right before they enter these different stages. And as we've been moving along through these visions, they've been getting sort of 
uh, progressively a little wilder or maybe not so much as wild as more and more difficult to interpret. And that, that would kind of make sense in a way because, you know, entry level bodhisattva-ness, first level bodhisattva-ness, that vision should be sort of uh, maybe, you know, a little more intelligible or understandable. And indeed, I, I read a little bit from the Vimalakirti Sutra, sort of about the, the Buddha revealing to the congregation this sort of jewel-filled world. And that indeed is the first vision that a bodhisattva has, is sort of seeing the various dharmas or the various phenomena of this world as sort of being jewel-like in some way. But as these have gone along, how to interpret these things. It's gotten trickier and trickier. And then we get to tonight. And I got to tell you, I was a little worried about tonight. I was a little worried about tonight last week. I knew, I knew what was coming. I've read the, I've read the sutra. I know what these visions are. So I, I knew, you know, but I, I was staying focused on last week's vision of the bodhisattva with their cudgel or maybe it's a magic wand or maybe it's a sword or a staff we don't know and the bodhisattva in her in her armor you know and like this these this vision of the bodhisattva in armor with a weapon it was like wow that's kind of hard to interpret and i tried to throw out a bunch of different interpretations but i knew tonight was coming <laughs> I, I knew this was coming and so after last week i sat down again and, you know, let me just walk, let me just walk you through this. This is how it goes. So, you know, this is the fourth vision that a bodhisattva will have before they abide in this fourth stage. So when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of, uh, they call it radiant flames. It's this uh, term for radiant or arkish in that way. The stage of radiant flames the fourth stage, the Bodhisattva will first have a vision of all kinds of rare flowers being scattered over the ground by the wind from four directions. That's what the vision is. And I've done, as, as usual, I've done my best to try to capture the vision of the Bodhisattva, seeing from these four, from the four directions, right? The, this, uh, the, the, the fourth level, the ground here being scattered with all kinds of rare flowers from the four directions. That's the vision. And again, I knew this was coming. And after last week, I was like, all right, here we go. I haven't the foggiest idea what that means. It's like, sure, I could wax, you know, I could wax for hours about flowers and Buddhism and you're, you're gonna get a bunch of flowers and Buddhism talk, but that's me sidestepping the issue. That's me pulling, you know, these upaya out and be like, oh yeah, you know, we got flowers and Buddhism. But what does it actually mean for the bodhisattva who's about to abide in the fourth stage to see all kinds of rare flowers being scattered over the ground, and in particular, from these four directions. Right? Well, so let me tell you, you know, the one thing to keep in mind, it's what I, it's what I had in mind going into tonight, I mentioned, of course, at the outset of the, these, these visions, and in particular, these 10 stages, that there is a, 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 an interesting relationship between the 10 paramitas, the 10 paramitas, and the 10 stages, that there is this kind of corollary. But it's a very poetic corollary. Like you can't get too hung up on these things, but you, it's very important to know that each of these stages in a way correspond to each of the paramitas. And the way that I 
talked about this in, in classes past was that you can kind of look at this uh, progression as a ladder and the rungs of each ladder are both a paramita and a bumi. This word bumi is our stages. These are the 10 bumis, the 10 stages. And what I had said is, is that there's an interesting way that you can look at the relationship between the paramitas and the bumis insofar as if you are below the rung and are using it as a way to get up, that's a paramita. But when you are firmly established on that rung, you are now on that rung. You're not using it to climb, you are established. And yet it's still the first rung, right? It's still that first step. But if you're, if you're using it as, a, as something to pull yourself up, it's a paramita. And so, for example, the first paramita, the first virtue or excellence of a bodhisattva is the paramita of giving, generosity. And so the idea is, is that one uses or does generosity to pull oneself up to firmly stand on that first boomy stage. And I don't mean to say that you, 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 you can abandon the other paramitas. It's not about that. It's that there's just this subtle relationship between each of these. That being said, tonight, we are focused on the fourth paramita of virya. Uh, I like to translate virya as drive. The standard translation is determination. Um, those are sort of two of the main ones. I don't want to probably bog you down with other translations. But the fourth paramita of virya, this determination, stick to itness drive, that is the, the practice or that is the virtue that we are using to pull ourselves up to this fourth boomy stage of the radiant mind. And so I just want to make that clear because this again is the knowledge I had going into tonight, which was like, okay, this has something to do with, with virya. <laughs> all right, so we've got flowers flying in from all directions. How does that, how does that pertain to virya, driver determination, right? Wow. Okay, so we keep digging around. And I mentioned last week, I mentioned last week that if you were, if you were really interested, if one is really interested in these 10 boomies, and this kind of paramita bumi complex that I'm talking about, then you should read the Avatamsaka Sutra, or at least you should read the 26th chapter of the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is a little sutra all onto its own called the Ten Stages Sutra. And it's about, it's about 100 pages long, 10 pages per each boomi, and it outlines this whole process. And so, you know, I had mentioned that last week about the boomies and about the, the, the boomi sutra. And so I, you know, I was like, I should take my own advice. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little foggy on what this, this vision means. And so, of course, I open up my Avatamsaka Sutra and I see these, these funny old notes that I've written, probably maybe from grad school or like whenever. And it, there are my notes that are in the, the fourth uh, Bhumi section of the Sutra. And it says, it's all about fours. That was a note to myself from a long time ago. It's all about fours which is an interesting uh, thing to, uh, for me to, to real, like remind myself of, or I don't know how that works exactly, but a younger me read the sutra and made a note. It's all about fours. 
And then I realized, oh, what an aus uh, auspicious part of this vision that these flowers are flying in from these four directions. Oh, now let me tell you what I meant by my note to my future self <laughs> regarding that it's all about fours. This is a very interesting boomy. And I, this, this particular boomy, it's, it's interesting because of its relationship to, oh, well, let me tell you this. What I realized when I was reading that section the, on the fourth boomy in the 10 boomies uh, sutra, there are a lot of references to all of the various Buddha's teachings that, that uh, happen in fours like the Four Noble Truths, the Four Means of Unification, the, the Four, um, I forget what they call those actually. And I should know, because it's the subject of tonight. I don't think they call it the Four Right Efforts because only two of them are right effort. So there's this thing in early Buddhism of these four things concerning um, cultivation of morality or cultivation of, of what are called roots of goodness. And this is actually a really special uh, realization uh, to connect tonight to this practice of cultivating good, wholesome roots. I mentioned that because if you can recall, this whiteboard for weeks and weeks and weeks was full of these illustrations I had made of these roots of goodness that were being cultivated. It was a, it's a beautiful metaphor in Buddhism and I wanna remind you of it because it, it is very much what tonight is about. So in the earliest, earliest practices of Buddhism, the earliest, earliest teachings, there was this very simple idea of well, it's part of the Eightfold Noble Path, but it's the idea of right effort. And that idea of right effort, that effort, that's virya. That's what we're talking about. Drive, determination, the sort of the putting forth the right effort. And in those early teachings, the practice or the cultivation of right effort it works like this. If you notice a good or wholesome root developing, like maybe like compassion, like you just notice yourself being compassionate, that's a good wholesome root that should be cultivated. If you think of the garden metaphor, where the idea is, is that we're trying to make a really nice garden here, right? And so the idea of developing a very nice garden is that you want to water and tend to those things that you would like to grow. So if you would want to cultivate compassion and would like to be more compassionate, then you need to identify those moments when you are compassionate and then water them and tend to them, notice them. The second, the second part of this is that if you don't notice any good or wholesome roots, you should work on getting some of them to, to, to sprout. <laughs> so if you see them, water them. And if you don't see them, then work on practices that would develop them so that you would have the little sprouts that you could then water. Likewise, there are unwholesome dharmas. There are unwholesome acts. You know, like anger, for example, we talked a lot about anger last week. And it's this idea of recognizing anger as a weed in the garden. And if you would like your garden full of weeds, then you could tend to those sprouts of anger and you could water them. But if you would rather not have your garden strangled with weeds, then the idea is, is that when one notices 
those roots, those unwholesome roots developing, you do not give them water. You don't give them attention. In other words, you let them dry up and go away. Likewise, if you notice, hey, I'm good on anger. I don't have any unwholesome anger arising. Yes, then you can continue to cultivate so that your garden has no, whatever you're doing then, keep doing it so that the garden doesn't have weeds. And the idea of the practice is that through cultivation, and in this sense, of course, the metaphor of cultivating is so beautiful because we are cultivating this garden of our mind in a way, or garden of the world. And so we're running around and we are noticing the wholesome and the unwholesome, and we are tending to the wholesome and, you know, sort of not neglecting the unwholesome, but we are definitely not feeding it the miracle grow, <laughs> right? And so that simple practice, and it actually took me, um, I'd say it, it took me becoming an adult before I realized how important that teaching is. It seems like it's so simple. Do good, don't do bad, right? Like every, everybody's been telling me that my whole life, every priest I've ever met, every rabbi, every everybody has been telling me, do good, don't do bad or whatever. And there's a way in which this, of course, isn't quite saying that. And maybe that's the problem with the priests and the rabbis or whoever, where it's sort of about do good, don't do bad, versus this very beautiful metaphor of these roots and the garden. And that if you put forth the right effort, because remember, you're the gardener here. It's, 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 about, it's up to you. And that's why it's your effort to either let the garden go and the weeds just strangle it all, or you cultivate this kind of garden in that way. So I've already sort of planted a number of seeds. Apologies for the metaphors just mounting on top of each other, but I've planted the seeds here for sort of the overarching metaphor for this evening, which of course are these flowers. And I wanna get back to the flowers, but I wanna stay focused on the, the virya meets effort, okay? So again, that's what we're talking about is, it's what I realized when I first read the Avatamsaka Sutra and I realized, oh, interestingly, the fourth Bhumi, that fourth stage is about, it, yes, it's about virya in the bodhisattva path, it's about the virya paramita, but what I really appreciate about this is that this stage that pays, it pays so much attention to that early practice of the, the right effort, that there's a way in which this stage really, um, well, all of the, all of this, but the, you know, there's something that I always like to say about this, you know, this gets a little wild, right? Visions of flowers and all of this. And I like to remind us that we have not strayed very far from our good old fashioned Dharma. It's really, really, really the same thing, but it's just this kind of more poetic way of talking about it and describing it. And I know that this isn't necessarily everybody's, you know, type of Buddhism. I get that, but it's my type of Buddhism for sure. And so I like to sort of make this kind of clear that there's this, um, that a lot of this, a, a lot of this is like, um, what can, what's the term? It's like window dressing for the, for the Dharma. But the Dharma is still the same. Like the thing in the window is still our good old Dharma, but it's just this sort of 
a, a slightly different way of thinking about it. So I just want to make that point. Any questions before I go any further about Viria, right effort, fourth boomy? Good on that. No, here. Yeah, no, hey. Hi. Just, just a, a quick question. So I, I get, uh, I get trapped in the English language with the word right because that implies a wrong. So yep. could you speak on that just a little bit for me? I would love to. Of course, this Thank this you. goes back to the the whole eightfold path. And the whole eightfold path is is um, uh, spoken in terms of not just view, but the right view. Not just effort, but right effort. Not just mindfulness, right mindfulness. It's this word samyak, samyak dristi, samyasmrti. All of these different samyak. And yes, Noe, I know exactly why you asked that question, because that seems very uh, oppositional in a way, or dualistic in that sense. And it is. <laughs> it is. And I, I, there's a number of different... Well, I could go down the whole Eightfold Path. I could go down the whole Eightfold Path. Let me... I know, Noe, that you really appreciate the Buddha's teachings on drishti on having these views, right? And so I'll use that as example. That's the first of the Noble Eightfold Path is having right view. There is, of course, in Buddhism, the idea of the wrong view. Yeah, there are many, 62 actually, according to the sutra that we read, but there's sort of one view in particular, which is that this is happening from the point of view of a self, a individual self that's trapped in a brain body and that maybe that self is a soul or something traveling through the cosmos and being reincarnated and all of that. That would be a view that you exist in some eternal sense and I'm traveling around. And so the Buddha extols right view, which is not that. <laughs> and so indeed there is a prop, and uh, uh, let me actually, I should have started with this. Samyak, right, it actually means proper or appropriate. And the idea of that is uh, proper or appropriate to the task of enlightenment. Right effort, just to, to bring it around, Noe, thank you for asking such a great question. Right effort, okay. What we describe, what I described with the roots and tending to them or not tending to them, that is considered the right effort. You could imagine though a different view, a different worldview a worldview that's say predicated on money, making money to equal security, that kind of a worldview. And if that was one's worldview, then the right or appropriate effort to that would be about making a lot of money and putting out the effort to make a lot of money. That would be the effort. Buddhism was, would say that is wrong effort. You're putting your effort in the wrong place. And I appreciate, no, I appreciate any kind of, um, you know, bodhisattva um, concern about ideas of right and wrong, or just kind of bodhisattva, what I always call like the duality alarm. When, when a bodhisattva's duality alarm goes off, I always actually get very excited because I think that's, that is the thinking. The thinking is the one that is sort of about like, wait a minute, that's a duality. Wait, you know, that's good. But we also don't want to kind of throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater in that way, where we get too uh, excited about throwing out dualities. And then we're like, yeah, let's throw out the duality of between wholesome and unwholesome dharmas. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> 
Michael, I have a thought about that, um, you know, because um, we often talk about this difference between um, ultimate reality and relative reality. And I think, you know, um, we definitely we have to acknowledge that we live in this, there is this, or let, not that we live, but that there is an experience of a relative world, which is clearly based on causality. I mean, you, this is something you can't deny. That doesn't mean this is ultimate real but it is an experience we agree on so um in that sense um uh, karmic behavior or karmic results and good or bad if you will exist so i think that sometimes that's why i'm struggling with advaita vedanta when everything is you know <laughs> um mm -hmm. ultimate reality and and you kind of sometimes deny every other experience so um, yeah, just, just, just some thoughts I felt called to, mm -hmm. to share. So thank you. Excellent thinking, Connie, as, as usual. And, you know, I would really like to just sort of take that moment to put the, you know, that causality is the name of the game. <laughs> that is the name of the Buddhist game. And that is, yeah, absolutely something that is unavoidable. But it's just about the, the, the wisdom here. And Connie, it's not that I don't think you know this. The wisdom here, of course, is, is this sort of um, that we, we're not always super wise and tuned in about causality. For example, the, the first, second, third noble truth being about that our this this desire this oh if if only this if only that that the wanting is causing the suffering that's a that's causality that we don't always consider we're not always wise in realizing oh i'm doing this to myself in that way and so causality again connie is the name of the buddhist game it's just actually about developing a deep wisdom about how deep, how deep understanding causality goes. So, yeah, questions, comments, answers, ideas. You know, and again, tonight, you know, I'm a little, like I have a little bit to say about this vision, but tonight's a really great night for conversation because um, it's kind of a open to interpretation kind of a night. <laughs> oh yeah tanya so and i apologize i was a few minutes late so maybe you already mentioned this but so this stage is called bright right or, or bright mind or bright mind or but you also said uh something about flame radiant flames that's just what they call it the okay. normal english one i'm not crazy okay. about that translation but Okay, so it's bright mind. Okay, because I was, I was like, that was what I was going to ask. Was like, bright what? Like, what ah. is this about? So it's the mind. Okay. Yes, very much. In fact, I have been. Oh, I will tell you that. Thanks, Tanya. That's a great segue to this. So, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, where this stage is properly called Arkishmati, the radiant intellect or radiant mind. There's a, I have another funny note in, in from back in the day. And it's, it's, it's a funny note that I wrote it, you know, a long time ago. And I, I, a younger me, a much younger me wrote it. And I still kind of stand by it as an interpretation for this, for, for Arkishmati, the radiant mind. We, we have a euphemism, I think in English about having like a mind on fire this really kind of like um, a, like a burning desire to know this kind of like that. I, there's an idea in, in English, again, it's almost a euphemism for having like a mind that's on fire that you like, you just, it's, it's, you just want to learn and learn and learn. It's like when you really crack the code on something, no matter what it is, and you just become really insatiably um, interested in it in that way, that is sort of very much part of this virya, 
it's very much a part if you read the whole section of the 10 stages sutra about this you really get this sense of of um the bodhisattva at this stage getting very excited about the dharma it's like this kind of real uh excitement and this vigor again the vigor the drive the determination to study and learn the dharma in that way but the but the deeper connection again in terms of the four directions being announced here that is again it's about these four right efforts these four it's about that and and in particular actually what they say and, and just interpret, you know, interpret this how you will. The idea of the bodhisattva path is that the bodhisattva that enters this fourth stage has eradicated unwholesome roots. There is an idea here that the, the mind has sort of been cleared of those unwholesome roots. And I actually want to read to you I want to read to you one little section from the 10 stages sutra i've been wanting to do this almost since we started i know i know many of you are familiar with the avatamsaka sutra this giant um you know giant three volume sutra i'm always waving about you know um and i've been wanting to read from it but i decided tonight's the night where i really want to just read a very very small section it's hard. This, this sutra is so hard to, to quote. <laughs> this is the hardest sutra to quote because the ideas, like, they spill out and ramble for, for pages and pages and pages. And it becomes very difficult to put your finger on exactly where it's all interesting. It's, it, but no particular part of it is interesting. It's like the whole way it unfolds. I think it's actually why this sutra is not as uh, well studied in, in the West or whatever, is because it does not lend itself to pithy Hallmark quotes at all. <laughs> um, it lends itself to 100 page discourses, right? But I did find in my reading of the this section, uh, about the fourth stage, I did find one little paragraph that I'd like to read. And it, again, it, I would like to also remind you, this is what I'm about to read is a description of a bodhisattva like deep in the fourth stage, not when they're about to abide in the fourth stage and have a vision of rare flowers being scattered all over the world. This is sort of once they've entered the fourth stage and are well established in the fourth stage. And I'm also reading this too, because at least for me, this get, uh, uh, allowed me to gain a deeper insight into what all of this might mean. So again, this is after, uh, two, three, two or three pages of descriptions of the bodhisattva in the fourth stage. Moreover, <laughs> the bodhisattvas in the stage of Arkishmati, the blazing intellect, are freed from all points of attachment. Attachment to what is considered wealth, to what is considered one's own possessions, to what is guarded and kept, to what is thought of, to what is ruminated on, what is conceived of, what is what appears and disappears, what arouses attachment to ideas of a real body. They are freed from attachment to self, being, life, growth, personhood, personality, the five uh, skandhas of mental and physicality, the four elements of the body, sense medium, whatever acts should not be done 
whatever acts are disapproved of by perfected Buddhas and provoke affliction, the bodhisattvas get rid of. Whatever acts should be done, whatever acts are approved of by perfected Buddhas, and are appropriate for provisions on the path of enlightenment, these the bodhisattva takes on. And I could read on and on, and that's where I would get trapped in, in, in an avatamsaka loop where we would never escape, so. <laughs> okay, so I actually would like to spend a little bit of time dissecting that. Again, I when I read well, when I read the whole section on the fourth stage, but in particular, when I read that, it actually lent me a lot of insight into this. So, you know, it begins by saying that moreover, the Bodhisattva in this stage is freed from all points of attachment. That, that right there actually immediately kind of opened my mind up to this image of these flowers scattering in from all directions. And my feeling about the interpretation there, I, tr I tried to capture where, what would usually be the little thought bubbles of Bodhisattva, <laughs> Akshayamati are these kind of flower thought bubbles. And so it's this kind of, I'm trying to capture kind of the Bodhisattva kind of disintegrating into this bouquet of flowers that has no center. All right, so that's my MC Owens interpretation of this flower imagery as insofar as it's these flowers blowing in from all directions, right? And again, I kind of get that insight from this line that a bodhisattva in the fourth stage is free from all points of attachment. But everybody feeling okay with that idea? I. I'll, I'd like to actually say a word about that real quick because I think it's really um, relevant. And it has to do, so that idea, so the Bodhisattva in the fourth stage is freed from all points of attachment. And it's sort of like, you know, it's one thing to sort of, I'm not attached to my car. <laughs> I'm not attached to my whatever. It's sort of one thing to be like, I'm, not attached to X, Y, or Z, right? But they're still, of course, in that equation, what, what I like to call a karmic axis. There's still a sense that there's something that's emanating out from this. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm Buddhist, no self and all. Yeah, there's no, but there's this, still this sense that it's emanating out from here and coming back to here. And there's a way, there's a way that what emanates out from over here and what emanates back over here, I'm like, eh, I don't have anything to do with that, that karma swirl or that karmic activity over there. Cause I've got this situation going on here. And that even though I'm a Buddhist and there's no Michael, I could still be rather attached to an axis in space and time at the expense of over here. So what is really profound, of course, about that statement that a bodhisattva in the fourth stage becomes free from all points of attachment is it's a really wild idea of like, oh, I'm not even expanding my sense to include like my sangha or my city or my state or my country or my universe. It's actually about being freed from any point of attachment. And then that becomes a kind of very interesting <laughs> space or way for the bodhisattva to be free from all points of attachment. So um, I've got a question. Yeah. So once you reach this fourth stage and you're freed from all of these points of attachment, it's sort of like once that happens, it's like you have the bodhicitta, you're free of all those attachments so you can pour yourself you know, into the dharma. You know what I mean? It's like you have the bodhicitta, the drive. It's like once you're free, 
it's like you like like you can give all of yourself to like like the wholesome roots you know what i mean because you're no longer being you know sucked in, you're no longer hooked excellent awesome comment exactly 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 and and i would just like to add i mean there's nothing to say there's nothing to add or say that amazing amazing comment just because we have time left just because only if only because we have time left i would add to that this so a lot of what you know a lot of what we have discussed you know we we're deep into this uh, uh part 19 now I, like i don't even know what part we are at right we're so deep into this but so it it it, it almost goes without saying but we need to talk about this and it's this idea that uh, these teachings about emptiness or these teachings about no self and being you know free from all points of attachment there is this way that in 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 lesser hands right in in the hands of a lesser sage that wisdom about emptiness could devolve into a kind of nihilistic why bother kind of whateverness and i really appreciated uh, the comment that was just made because it totally recognizes oh now i have a lot more time and energy for everybody else because i'm not hung up and and hooked you you put it so well sir but you're not hung up and hooked here anymore and it really frees you up in that way so excellent excellent in that truly bodhisattva way where it's like oh wow now that we got that taken care of <laughs> Everybody good? Sweet. So this freed from all points of attachment is a kind of a very interesting idea, of course. And then this wonderful list of particular things that the Bodhisattva is freed from, uh, wealth, possessions, whatever is guarded and kept, which by the way, you could go for days psychologizing that idea whatever is guarded and kept whatever you're holding on to right whatever is guarded and kept whatever's thought of ruminated on or conceived of so now we're even um you know this is an interesting idea too even the ideas and ruminations and things that are conceived of there's no point of attachment as to the self and a very interesting thing that comes to mind, and this is just a, um, uh, what we call it, like a thought experiment. Uh, it's just a, a suggestion for something to think about. And it is this idea of like, uh, well, it's the idea of having an idea. And, you know, I'm, I'm even actually thinking very, very modernly because I'm, I'm thinking about IP, intellectual property. So in this world that is very, very interested in IP and intellectual property, it's a very interesting way of looking at ideas and this, this thing of like, oh, I had an idea. I had an idea for a new whatever. And, you know, there's a way in which it's like, yeah, that's, you know, we have ideas. I have ideas. We all have ideas or whatever. But there's a funny, interesting Buddhist way, a kind of dependent origination, interconnected way of looking at how, you know, there's a, there's a way in which any idea you have owes a lot of credit to all of these other ideas you've been exposed to. All these books you've read, all these YouTube videos you've watched, all these things you've heard about, all of that actually lent itself to you having your great idea. And there's an interesting way in which to be like, oh, I have this great idea all by myself. It's mine. I own it. Now I can sell it. There's a sort of like disingenuousness, disingenuousness about that that doesn't quite fully recognize or respect that we don't have ideas all by ourselves in that way. 
that they are very dependent on everybody else's ideas. And so I'm not actually trying to suggest that one should, that a good Buddhist doesn't, you know, claim their intellectual property. It's not at all what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that the mentality that, that clings to even the very ideas they're having as their own, as some sort of like mine, me and mine, from a Buddhist point of view, that the clinging or attachment to even the ideas you're having as your own ideas might be a subtle form of clinging. And of course, the, the Buddhist thing to think about is how there might not be any risk in letting that go, but there might be great benefit. Just a suggestion about like what is gained by holding on to that, and then what is potentially lost by holding on to that. Again, I'm not saying one way or the other. It's just about pointing out the very, very subtle relationship we have with the very ideas we're having. Questions, comments, ideas about that? Just throwing that out there, R riffing off the sutra. Cool. So yeah, Bodhisattva freed from all of those, from even from what is thought of, what is ruminated on, what is conceived of. And then ultimately freed from attachment to ideas of a real body, a real self, a being, a life, growth, person or personality. So that's describing this bodhisattva in the fourth stage. So now we've dealt with a few, we've dealt with a few of the pieces of this puzzle, right? I tried to suggest the significance of the number four appearing in the vision, and it's because this stage. Uh, oh, and I only I only emphasized the part that was about the four right efforts, the not allowing the unwholesome dharmas to arise and. But in this section, there is a lot of references to the Four Noble Truths and the Four Means of Unification. And so there's this real, everything's happening in fours in this level. So just point that out. Yeah, no. Am, am I remembering correctly or did I understand correctly that the four right efforts are cultivating wholesome roots, not cultivating unwholesome roots when noticing that there are not unwholesome roots cultivating that and when noticing that there are not wholesome yes. roots not cultivating that, is that those are the four <laughs> okay uh, one second okay yeah and a lot of times you know they have this idea of right effort and a lot of people wonder like well what is that what does that mean and that's the def the classic definition of right effort got it sorry everybody we Michael, are you doing your magic? Here? No, I just, I'm having a hair emergency. <laughs> it's kind of awesome to watch. Okay, well, it's a rare occasion. All right. <laughs> okay, so the four is the reference to the four right efforts and things in four. The stage is this reference to virya. Let's talk flowers, right? So this is not the first time that this has come up, the flowers, before it was these lotuses. And I wanna uh, point out last, uh, not last week, but the week before, it was these jeweled lotus flowers. And it was in the, the sutra was very clear that it was about lotus flowers. And so I spent time talking about the lotus flower in particular, the metaphor of the lotus rising out of the mud and all of that. So, I do think that, you know, the load, I, I don't think, the Lotus Sutra holds a very special place in the land of Buddhism. But there's also just a general um, uh, floral, a, a floral thing going on with Buddhism. We're really, really into flowers. <laughs> and you know, I've read so many sutras and so many examples of this that there's a, okay, so what, what's with the flowers, all right? 
what there's so many that come to mind that I'm going to try to limit it to, I, I don't know how many, but we'll start with this one. I mentioned, and I even read, um, this, this might actually pique a lot of people's interest. So um, this, at some point a few weeks ago, I read from the Vimalakirti Sutra. And I read from the Vimalakirti Sutra because in it, there's this point, right? Where everybody sees the world as covered in these jewels. And I read it because I said, wow, that sounds like the first vision that a bodhisattva has before they enter the first stage. And isn't that interesting that in the Vimalakirti Sutra, the whole audience has that vision in chapter one. In chapter one, like before we get started on this story. Very interesting. So for the Vimalakirti heads in the audience, I would just like to point out that there occurs such a vision in the Vimalakirti Sutra. And it's that, it's that part when all of these flowers start raining down from out of nowhere. And the, and the audience indeed has a vision of the ground covered in flowers scattered. It doesn't say from the four directions, but what I'm getting at is, is that, and I haven't done this. This is the kind of, um, this is actually the kind of research project I'm, I'm involved in, but I've got a lot of irons in the fire right now, but I would love to go through the Vimalakirti and try to, de to detect all 10 of these visions because all they seem to be appearing. And so it's like, oh, wow, is the Vimalakirti just a narrative built around the 10 visions that a Bodhisattva has before they enter the 10 stages? I don't know, but if you would like to, you know, delve further into the raining flowers metaphor or analogy, read the Vimalakirti Sutra. <laughs> so that's one interesting thing, not just in the Vimalakirti Sutra, but in many Mahayana Sutras, not Pali Suttas, not the old school Suttas, but in many Mahayana Sutras, you get flowers raining down and covering the ground, all right? So it's a metaphor that is used, and so that's interesting. But what could that mean, right? What, what, could, that pop, what could that be alluding to? Well, I mean, I, there's two things that I can think of. I mean, I can think of more, but there's two things I can think of that I could, I could say a bit about. There's, there's, okay, I'm going to start with the first one. Neither of these, neither of these I'm fully convinced of. So I want to say that from the beginning. I'm putting these out there as total possibilities. And so if you're like, I don't know, Michael, I think you're going out on a limb. You, you're probably right. But I want to remind you of a very particular flower metaphor that gets used in Mahayana Sutras. And it's not the one necessarily about them raining everywhere, but it's, it's not the lotus flower. It's this other flower. And indeed, it is described as sometimes a multicolored flower, sometimes as um, um, strange or auspicious in that way. And this is, this is it. And whether this is the right interpretation or not, it doesn't matter. It's a really good excursion into some good Dharma. <laughs> so there's a, a couple of sutras where this happens, where the Buddha mentions this. And what he talks about is, is that he talks about a a person who has a cataract, they have a, uh, a film, this kind of uh, film cataract over their eye. And as a result of that cataract, when, when they look up at a light, there appears a multicolored flower floating in the air in front of them. And the Buddha has this whole conversation with Ananda 
about where the flower is. Is there a flower floating in the air in front of the person with the cataract? And Ananda says, no, it's because of the cataract. And so the Buddha says, oh, so the flower is in the guy's eyeball. And Ananda says, well, no, because if he, he has the cataract, but if he turns and looks the other way, the flower disappears. So it can't be a product of the cataract. And so Ananda goes, oh, you're right. It's the light. It's the light that causes the, the thing. And the Buddha says, but when a different person who doesn't have a cataract looks at that light, they don't see a flower. So it can't be the light. And in, that, in the sutra that I'm thinking of, which the, is the Shurangama Sutra, that's where Ananda and the Buddha have this dialogue. It's a great dialogue about dependent origination. And it's what it is, is, it, is the Buddha uses it to say that the multicolored flower arises from both the cataract and the light. And if you don't have the light or you don't have the cataract, you don't have a flower. And so it is dependent on both of them. And ultimately actually what the Buddha uses that as a description for is that it is the ignorant unenlightened person that thinks there's a flower floating in the sky. It's the enlightened person that understands the causes and conditions that result in that flower. And that actually ties us way back to Connie's comment long time ago about causality, that this is about understanding causality and not being myth, not misunderstanding it. I digress. If you understand that, that analogy of the light the cataract and the arising of this multicolored flower, eventually in that sutra and then within Mahayana Buddhism, you could ex extrapolate that to start seeing any given phenomena as a multicolored flower floating in the air in front of you that is being arisen based upon the causes and conditions of your uh, samskara, your conditioning, all kinds of things. I don't want to get too into the nitty, nitty gritty of that, but the idea is, is that there's a way in which you could start to see all phenomena as multicolored flowers arising out of dependent origination. That's one possible interpretation for this vision of the flowers everywhere. Just one possibility. And again, I'm drawing on other sutras to make that interpretation. So. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about that? Just wanted to share that. Okay. So is, is, is what you're saying sort of a, that the vision is, it's almost like a metaphor that the, 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 the Bodhisattva at this stage sees everything as dependently originated. Is that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a perfect uh, of what I was suggesting. Okay, you were now, suggesting. I'm not saying that's true, but that's right. exactly what I was trying to suggest for sure. Um, okay, now let's really uh, take a step back and talk about flowers. Again, these flowers are appearing in sutures left and right. And I think, you know, one of the things too about these flowers is, you know, it's important at that point to remember that the big sutra, the Avatamsaka sutra that I keep mentioning, that this little sutra that we're doing is just a really, like just a summary of the big Avatamsaka sutra. Well, Avatamsaka means the flower garland. And in the Avatamsaka sutra, what they talk a lot about is the flower bank world and not a bank like uh, where you would go get money but like a, like a, a like a mountain a bank just a, a wall of these flowers 
And eventually when you start going through the Avatamsaka Sutra, you start having, or you start being shown these kind of visions of the flower bank world. And it's just this overwhelming vision of like flowers cascading out of flowers, cascading out of flowers. And as they cascade, they, they build and, and mount and, and make banks. And it, it becomes a, you know, a really intense uh, kind of uh, excursion in the Avatamsaka Sutra through that flower bank world. And in reading that and, and reading the Sutra, it's made me wonder a lot about what are they talking about? What is, what is this imagery, you know? And again, I don't know. And I really, really am, I'm, at this point, I'm really just offering total suggestions right here. I do not know, but there is certainly, well, first of all, there's certainly something undeniably kind of beautiful about flowers. Let's just start there, right? We, I don't, I think it would be lame. We would be totally lame to just, to miss the obvious. Do you know what I mean? Like to start getting into some really like, well, it's like, no, they're beautiful. <laughs> they're totally, to, I don't know how much time you have spent looking at flowers, but man, oh man, the geometry, the palettes of colors involved, it's, re it's insane. It's really, really insane. And I think that there is just a simple, a really simple kind of um, a thing going on here about stopping and smelling the flowers type of, of, of thing, first of all, where, you know, it's like, there's that, <laughs> they're beautiful. I mentioned a number of nights ago, uh, at, uh, somehow it, it came up and it was about the ephemerality of flowers. We spoke, I think I spoke about the, the cherry blossom season in Japan, you know, and this, you know, they, they wait all year for just this one week and it's like this, this precious moment, but of course, if cherry blossoms were in bloom all the time, we would get bored with it. it would, they would lose their, and indeed, you know, flowers are in a way so special because they are ephemeral and fleeting. So there's something, oh, I don't know, can I say anicca? There's something impermanent about flowers that's very, very, very Buddhist. So there's that. I have mentioned, in, in too many Dharma talks to count. I have mentioned that the English word bud, like to bud, to a flower bud, is that word bud comes from the Sanskrit bud, like our Buddha and like buddhi, bodhi, awakening, Buddha, an awakened one. The reason why, and I don't, I have one right here. So the reason why, Buddhas are always on these flowers is because they're talking about the budding, the flowering and the opening as a metaphor for the mind, the, the spirit, whatever you wanna call it, but this kind of flowering and opening of the bodhisattva, bodhicitta, I don't know, but that idea of the flowering and the opening and the awakening is such a deep part of Buddhism as a metaphor, as an operating metaphor. So now we have this beautiful ephemeral awakening, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm starting to try to weave this together about what, what could all of this, you know, be pointing at? What are these flowers all about? So their beauty, their ephemerality, this whole awakening, budding, opening. But then if you really get into your botany, if you really start to get into flowers as the reproductive organs of plants and the way and their relationship to reproduction 
I'm talking about the birds and the bees. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm talking about this really, really subtle, um, um, I don't know how to put exactly what I'm trying to say, but it's like, you know, I don't know if I'm the bee and the Dharma's the flower and I'm buzzing around or if, I don't know who's what and where's what, but there's definitely some sort of like, um, uh, how can I put this? Like, like, so it, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to just leave that one where it is. Again, it's a very raw idea about the, the role that flowers play in the reproduction of plants. And then if we adopt this flower metaphor in Buddhism, what does that mean? And I, I put that out there as just like a, a something to entice you. <laughs> it's not even, again, a finished thought. It's just about thinking about flowers in their natural environment and the role that they play. Michael, what, what also comes to my mind in regards to flowers, um, where flowers play a very important role is when it comes to death and funerals. If you think about it, I think almost every tradition I can think of um, has always this, like either you um, throw a flower in the grave, you know, that is very, you know, like in the in Christian Christianity, mm -hmm. but also in Buddhism, you decorate the, um, you know, dead people with flowers. Mm -hmm. So it is for me something of like, yeah, the, 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 you know, it, I don't know, it's what come came to my mind. So uh, the connection to death. And also transitioning to the other realm, whatever that means in in different contexts and different religions slash traditions. Yeah. Yeah, Connie. And actually, even I I hear you and I agree with you. I, I, however, though, I would suggest that their relationship is not death, but they symbolize life and this sort of. Um, it's almost sort of a balancing act with death to have flowers on the grave, if you will. Yeah. Or at least that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. But that's neither here nor there. But it did make me think about a certain celebratoriness of life that happens with flowers. So there's a celebration of life going on here. Oh, isn't yeah. there a one thing isn't there a mala or no no not mala but um how do you call it a mandala out oh, the flower of life absolutely Ooh. i have one more point and it has to do with the flower of life oh cool perfect <laughs> you, you read my mind connie tani did you have one yeah i was just you know when you're talking about bees and you know flowers and well you know if you think about like when a flower gets fertilized right you get a fruit so i mean i don't know you've got the opening of the mind you've got some sort of you know it's very fertile right you have this dance between the bee and the and the flower we can talk about what those metaphors are which produces the fertilized flower which then you get a fruit from and then you get a seed from that fruit that then makes the plant and then you know yep I'm a biologist. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm picking that up. Um, and actually, you're, what you're describing is, is exactly my thoughts on the flower of life that Connie mentioned. So this all ties together really, really perfectly for this sort of last. So this is my last interpretation of the flowers. Um, I saved it for last because it's like, my strongest argument in that way. And it, again, it has to do with both comments that were just made by Connie and Tanya. But I, and I planted the seeds for this at the beginning of the talk. So it was about the going back to my 10 stages sutra and remembering, oh yeah, this stage is all about the four right efforts, which is about roots, 
and about the garden, about cultivating these roots. And indeed, Tanya, this is about, there's this metaphor. It's, it, it, it's a further, it's a totally different metaphor, but it ties in with all, everything we've said. And it's this way of describing like, um, well, basically it's kind of this beautiful way of describing ideas and thoughts as like the blooming of these flowers and this way in which there can, that could be going on with no possessor or owner of those thoughts. And so I'm suggesting that these opening, these blooming flowers are likened to ideas, but not just any old ideas, not just any old concepts. I'm tying this together with the, the garden metaphor, which is this idea that if you cultivate this garden, you get rid of the weeds and those, those, those unwholesome roots that would strangle your, your garden, then there is this way in which the, the mind that, or the, the bodhisattva that has cultivated that way, the garden blooms. So it's like a beautiful metaphor. And this is what I said, I, I, I snuck this in at some point, but it's about this idea that a bodhisattva in the fourth stage is, has no more bad roots. They're just cultivating their good roots. So there's this whole like, again, all of this is interpretation, which is lovely. I, I love interpretation. I don't want anybody to walk away, you know, thinking any of these have been the interpretation. I'd, I'd rather find five more, right, than find the one. So I just want to share with you that possible way of looking at these flowers as connected to the garden metaphor. But then a further, a further kind of, uh, well, what I like, I read unattached from any point and these kind of just flowering of ideas, flowering. So questions, comments, ideas about that. <laughs> no. Come on, you gotta give me something to work with. Oh, flower life. I didn't finish the flower life. So, um, there is this idea of the flower of life and there is sort of a whole, this, oh, this might also further entice people to read the Avatamsaka Sutra. <laughs> so this, the reason why I mention these uh, flowering, the flowering of ideas and the flowering of thoughts is in the Avatamsaka Sutra, there's a way, if you go through the whole thing, this, this vision, these visions that are kind of like the visions described in this sutra, they're a, a little different, but the, the visions in the Avatamsaka Sutra, they kind of keep building and keep building and keep building until there is this description of what I described as the flower bank world where there's just the flowers start amassing. And all of that does eventually culminate in this kind of grand vision of this. I mean, it's a lot more than a thousand petaled lotus, but it is that, it is that idea of a extremely vastly petaled kind of lotus flower that a lot of um, you know, spiritual or mystical traditions speak of a vision of a either a chrysanthemum. The in the eight, more Chinese tradition, they speak more of a chrysanthemum. Um, Carl Jung spoke of such a flowery vision. Um, a lot of different people have spoken of such a vision. I've even heard of modern day psychonauts taking all kinds of substances and seeing similar uh, floral designs. And so I would just like to take a moment to pay respect to that type of um, um, commonality or like when something keeps appearing all over the place, it's like, we gotta be like, all right, time out everybody. What's this whole flower thing about? 
So I just want to point to you that this is not unique to Buddhism, but if it's a thing or if it's it's a if it's a um if the flower metaphor, or even if it's more than a metaphor for you, like if it's an experience in that way, if that is something that appeals to you, then the Avatamsaka Sutra is something that you might want to look into because it's such a, um, that's what it's all about. Like, that's what it's all about is, is that kind of vision of things. Um, which is why when people read the Avatamsaka Sutra, they, they say, wow, this is kind of psychedelic. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so. It kind of, kind of makes me think of fractals, right? You know, like, you know, you know about fractal, you know, it's like it just keeps going and going and just blooming and blooming and just, you know. Indeed. And fractals are very Buddhist in that way, aren't they? Yeah. Right? So there's that. Uh, Connie mentioned also in, in her comment about mandalas, that's something I, I didn't even touch upon, but everybody knows I've done talks on mandalas, you know, so the flowers, the flowers relationship man, to mandalas is right there too, where they are like this naturally occurring mandala, but then what's the mandala all about, right? There are questions, comments, ideas about flowers, mandalas, fourth stage bodhisattva hood. I think I got all of my notes. Michael, I was wondering about the flower in the sky. I had a comment about it, but I was wondering why it's there. This one? The big one. I don't know. I was just, I was trying, you know. <laughs> so when I first. Balance? Well, when I first started drawing it, they were all this, like, the same uh, same size or whatever. Yeah. So, and I didn't want it to just be full of flowers. Yeah. I wanted to convey that they're flying in from all these different directions, Got it. right? So well, I just, just a comment really not related to much of anything, but when you mentioned just your awe at the beauty of flowers and their ephemerality, I suddenly like, saw it in my mind the one of the most stunning moments of my life was when I got to see the solar eclipse a couple of years ago and and it it actually looks like a flower when when it's a full eclipse it's like the sun becomes a flower and it's ephemeral like beyond ephemeral because you know basically you've waited your whole life for it it lasts a couple of minutes and then it's gone it's like this level of ephemerality that's just astounding so i was that is i realize that's way off topic but i just wanted to mention that as and and maybe it isn't in the sense that some of what you were talking about i mean uh fractals and flowers and visions and mandalas i mean there's a there's a there's a geometry to our physical universe that makes these things look alike and you know i think that's part of what's going on with the solar eclipse as well Absolutely, absolutely no. And interesting comparison between the vision, the visual of it, and the ephemerality of it in that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I really, I, I thought I would actually be able to convey that more my deeper feelings about flowers, but I have to admit, I really, I really feel like I came up short on that because I I, I spend a lot of time photographing and looking at flowers and have gotten very interested in their an anatomy, their everything. And they're so mysterious and they're, and in particular, the, that geometry aspect, sure call it Fibonacci sequence or whatever, but that, what, Noam, what you said, like that aspect of them. So there's something very special let's say, go, going on with flowers. And again, you know, whether it's, whether it's the artwork or the sutras or the visions and imagery, the Buddhists are very into flowers. And so I definitely feel like tonight I've, I've made it clear, like I have, I don't know, I have these feelings, I have these, you know, whatever, a few sutras to go on. But I would just like kind of, yeah, suggest that you kind of if, if this is something that interests you, yeah, to like kind of 
take that step back and look at flowers, their relationship to the whole organism. I think that's a big part of this. Their, their relationship to the larger organism in that way. So again, I really, it's, I, I think it is just one of those things is just, you can't really describe such things. Well, I don't think you totally failed since you evoked that response in me. Like that indicates that you had some success. Very kind of you to say though. <laughs> yeah, I would say that too. Cause again, like the whole idea for me, like the fractals, it's just like this all coming up and coming up and the flowers and the, and even when you look at flowers, sometimes, you know, if you look at the, there's, it's kind of, you know, it's like a repeating pattern and, you know, and it just feels to me like this abundance of beauty and kind of just spouting up like in a really beautiful kind of way. So it makes me curious about the larger sutra. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and indeed, you know, the visions become very surreal insofar as the flower, the calyx, the pistis, actually the pistis, I didn't even think to tell you this and it's a little, probably a little late, but we have a few minutes. In that sutra, they describe this flower world and the pistis is Mount Maru and the calyx are the mountain ranges around it. And so they create a whole cosmology of our world as being on a flower, which of course is a very beautiful image as well. <laughs> so. Any other questions, comments, ideas? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you can hear me okay, yeah, Jimmy. that um, the, what, you, what you were saying before brought up the idea of the, the complexity of flowers' geometry, color, their function, and how that, that it's, there's so much to it. It's vast. So you, there's really no end to what can be explored in that. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why we get to a point um, in this, it's, it's more than a metaphor, but we get to a point where there's just, there's nothing more to say because we could just go on and on and on and on and on forever about it. And it's gorgeous. You know, and it and it does keep cropping up all over the place. I mean, I remember being in Guatemala many, many years ago and going around to all the markets and buying huipiles and all of the weavings, most of them incorporated some kind of flower imagery and it was completely gorgeous. And after a day long of being in these markets doing that, I'd go back to my pension and I'd lie down and I'd close my eyes and it would just be this explosion of color behind my eyelids in my dark room because I'd been like checking this stuff out all day long. And even the weavings were so intricate and so vast in their complexity that, you know, I mean, yeah, even the representation of flowers in art no matter what it, it's it's nuts yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure you know and just actually one last note on these beautiful flowers and it's just a funny one i had mentioned and 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 i'm so glad by the way that we've had this great conversation about flowers because this is not the last vision that will include flowers, in fact, next week and the week after. So this will all be great to keep in mind. But I, for those who have read the Vimalakirti Sutra and know the scene I'm talking about, the flowers falling from the sky and all of that, I would like to remind you of what happens in that part of the Sutra, which is that there is this monk, right? This Shariputra who kind of represents this earlier, more austere, monastic type of Buddhism. And what's funny, of course, in the Vimalakirti Sutra is that these flowers that start falling everywhere, they start sticking to the monk. And he's like, oh, and he's trying to get them off. And, 
and he eventually gets reprimanded and like, why are you trying to get rid of these flowers? And he tries to explain, well, the Buddha said it's against the, the rules for us to wear flowers and garlands and things like that. And yes, there, that part of the sutra is speaking about the dogmatism of early Buddhism and getting kind of too uh, hung up in the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law in that sense. But there's also another significance to that point, which is that that monk, that Shariputra, doesn't like all this flower business. He wants his Buddhism without any flowers. And indeed, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, and a lot of these sutras, they're flowery. And so it's an interesting thing when there's this type of Buddhist that's like, I don't want any of this flower Buddhism. You know, you can kind of imagine a type of person that wants their Zen, their hardcore Zen. And it's like, don't give me any flowers. And it's kind of a, uh, it's just a funny part of the sutra about this sort of, uh, and I think tonight we have all sort of celebrated the, the flowers tonight, so. <laughs> well, I had a quick interjection, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when Buddha is sitting under the tree and he is attacked by Mara, he transmutes his arrows into flowers. And so when all these flowers are, you know what I mean? It's like, doesn't that like kind of tie in? I mean, is that like Buddha transmuting the arrows and Mara into flowers? I mean, Come on, that's awesome. This is the this is the type of, uh, this is what I hope for Dharma doors is this wonderful, exactly man, talk about an obvious thing I missed, which is that Bodhisattva about to abide in the fourth stage, psh, all the arrows turned to flowers, all the fear gone. Psh, excellent interpretation. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> much obliged for that comment. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna go on to the fifth vision of the Bodhisattva next week. Um, and that'll be something. <laughs> All right, everybody, until then, have a great week. Have a great night. <laughs>